It's good to be with you today. Hey, we are in week number two of our sermon series uh, we call What's the Line? What's the Line? Here's how we're going to play this, this series out. I'm going to talk about something uh, that's probably something you don't often hear about in church. So next week, I'm going to take on the topic of abortion. It's kind of a hot topic in our culture right now, but the truth is, it's something that it probably should have been talked about anyways over the years. What's, what's God's stance on life and choice? And does the Bible have anything to say about that? And then after the sermon's over, we're going to open up an opportunity for you to send in questions that you have regarding that. Because here, here's what happens when you ta- take on a topic like that. It's often like opening a can of worms. Did you guys know on Amazon you can get anything, even a can of worms? <laughs> right? And if you opened up, I'm not going to open this up because it's, it's, I can smell it from here, right? It smells. And so, but if you opened up the can of worms, right, there's a, I don't know why there's a spoon in here, but there is. And so, I don't understand. We're just going to get rid of that. And so, uh, but if you opened up the can of worms, uh, it gets, it's going to make more of a mess. It's, it's easier just to keep it closed and clean and, you know, tidy and black and white. And so these messages are going to open up, I think, a can of worms. And I, I'm okay with that. I think the Bible wants us to wrestle through topics, uh, wants us to handle tough questions, wants us to use some biblical common sense, so to speak. And so last week I talked to you on the topic of of sex, sexuality, marriage, homosexuality quickly. What does the Bible have to say on on sex? And I just want to give you a forewarning. I told you the same thing last week. This this message is going to be a little bit more uh, uh, rated, I don't want to say rated R, because that's in church and we're not allowed to watch rated R movies in church. And so rated PG-13. Like it's, it's, there's going to be some things in this message. If you want to be, understand where we're going or see it, you can open up your Bible app right now. If you have that, you can see the questions we're going to take on. And if you're here with the child, you say, I don't want them to hear that from you. I'd rather tell them that in a few years. You can take them to Journey Kids at any point. You're not going to embarrass us. Everybody's going to think you're mad when you get up and walk out. They're not. They're just taking their kids. You, you know, ever notice that? Like somebody walks out, you're like, are they mad? Probably, right? But it's okay. It happens in church. And so sometimes you just have to go to the bathroom. And so why don't you mind your own business? You know what I'm saying? And so, so that's where we're at. But I'm going to talk to you through some questions that came in on Monday following last week's sermon, sermon uh, on the topic of, of sex. And so uh, and we're going to kind of use these ground rules. First one is this. If the question is black or white, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. And uh, we're not going to get mad about it. We're not going to get upset about it. It's what the Bible says. The Bible's truth. We're going to hold to that. And so if you ask the easy enough question where I can say, here's what it says in the Bible, I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. If your question is a little bit uh, more gray area, I'm going to find, hopefully in Scripture, what I would call biblical practical sense, right? Some common sense. Anybody notice common sense is kind of lacking in our culture? Uh, We're going to go to Scripture. We're going to form some biblical common sense, and we're going to answer that. If your question is so crazy that I don't know the answer to it. I'm just going to give you my opinion. We're going to move on, okay? And so, and I'm going to tell you it's my opinion. We can have a difference of opinion. Here's something our culture needs to understand. You can have a difference of opinion still like each other, right? Like you don't, just because you don't agree with somebody doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means you don't agree with them. And so uh, we're going to jump right in. I figured I'd take on an easy one to start off our questions. Uh, question number one, should Christians attend gay weddings? I thought we'd take an easy one, right? You're just throwing it out there. Should a Christian attend a gay wedding? So let's just establish what the Bible had to say last week. I'm, I'm not, here's what I don't want, want to do. I don't want to ask you what culture thinks. I don't want to ask you, you know, what's been established as right or wrong in our world. There's a lot of things in our world that are okay, that biblically are not okay. And so the uh, Bible talks about homosexuality a, a few times, m- more, than, more than twice, like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Never once talks about it as something that's good. So you have, like, when we talk about is homosexuality a sin, is it right or wrong, the Bible talks about it. It's not like you can go in there and figure out the Greek and the Hebrew and work your way around it, and that's not what they meant, and what about this? It's really black or white. It's, it's, not, a, it's not up for debate. I'm not asking you if culture thinks it's acceptable. I'm not asking you. I'm just telling you, biblically, it's, it's not okay. And so when you deal with things in, in our world that aren't okay, that are sin, it's always, it's always a weird uh, kind of what, it's always weird to deal with it in a, in a Christian way, uh, the right way. Like, like some of you are like, what do I do, you know, if a friend invites me to a wedding where they're having an affair, uh, at an affair, and now they're getting remarried with the person they had an affair with, and, you know, they, they thought, they, they said they were Christians, but the whole thing's crazy. Look, like, what do I do in that situation? What, what should I, it's kind of the same thing. Like, what do I do if I have a friend? Because here's the thing about it, all of us at one point are going to be put in this situation. It's so prevalent in our culture. You're going to work with somebody. We should be kind. 
We should be grace-filled. Uh, we should constantly be there to, 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 to listen. That's what Christians do. We're there to make things better. Naturally, you're going to come into contact with people that aren't Christians, that don't come to church, that you're still kind to, that you form relationships with. It's going to happen in our families at one point. We're going to have an uncle or a, a kid that says, you know what, I came out of the closet. And they're going to celebrate in June, and it's going to be really a difficult situation for you. You're not going to know how to handle it. What, what do you do? And so here's the two answers and, that I found in Scripture, two ways Christians would go. First way Christians could go is they're going to go, uh, well, Jesus ate with sinners and uh, tax collectors, and uh, he didn't see anything wrong with that, and so I don't see anything wrong with going to, to, to a wedding. And I, I th- tell you, I, I would respect that. I'm not, not going to tell you that's unbiblical, that's not wrong, you shouldn't do that. I'm going to tell you my opinion on the situation. Uh, there's a lot of situations in my life where people do things I don't agree with that I'm still okay being near. But marriage is a different thing. Marriage is not an American-made thing. That's the problem with us when we don't biblically build ourselves. Marriage was ordained by God between a man and a woman. It's really clear from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2. God made male and female, made them separate and different but equal. It's really important. We're not better than each other. We complement each other. We complete one another. If you know biology, we go together. Are you tracking with me? God God did a good thing in that situation. He made marriage between man and a woman. So I'm not worried about how the world is defining marriage. I'm not worried about if they're saying love is love. I'm going to go to the scripture. The Bible says that marriage is between a man and a woman. Here's the second thing. When you go to a wedding, it's different than going and eating. You go eat with somebody, you're at a, you know, a party with somebody, graduation with somebody, sitting at a table with somebody at work. These are different than going to a wedding. And here's why. When you go to a wedding, your presence there is signifying that you approve of what's going on. That, that's why you're there. I don't know about our culture, but the reason you're invited, I'm a pastor, so I did a wedding yesterday. I stood here, a man and a woman walked up here, and they invited 25 of their closest family and friends. You know why they were there and I was there? I was there because I legally can marry them. They were there because they love each other. Their family was there to support them. Most important person there was God because God ordained it. So every person who was there, they used to ask this. They used to say, if anybody, you know, has a problem with this, speak now forever, hold your peace. We don't ask that anymore because everybody has a problem with it, right? (laughs) We don't even give people that option because we're afraid of the scene. But in old days, you were there to approve. And I, I, for me, I feel like a hypocrite when I approve of something that the Bible says is sin, and the Bible says sin grows and brings death. So if you were to say to me as a pastor, would you go to a gay wedding because you love and you want to be like Jesus? And you, I, would say, I would say if I had a friend that invited me to a wedding that you know, knew where I stood, invited me, I would sit down with them. I wouldn't call them. I wouldn't just decline it. I wouldn't not RSVP. I wouldn't ignore them. I would sit down with them and I would clearly state, here's what I believe about marriage. Here's, here's what the Bible teaches. Here's what my faith is. I love you, but I can't approve of what's going on. And here's the goal. When it hits rock bottom, because the Bible says sin grows and brings death, I want to be where I'm supposed to be to lead them to Jesus. If you walk with them towards sin, guess what happens when both of your lives fall apart? You look back and go, oh, crap, one of us is supposed to stay there. Story of the prodigal son. Prodigal son leaves. The father stays. You ever notice that? The father doesn't go with him and say, let's both go sin. The father stays because he knows his son's life's going to fall apart. And when his son's life falls apart, the father is there to meet him when he comes home. This is the role of a Christian. So if you ask me, would you go to a gay wedding? I, I, I wouldn't because I don't want to be a hypocrite and approve of something that the Bible says is a sin. Okay? We started with the light one. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> this one's always been awkward, but I figured we'd get the awkward one, one out of the way. Let's go. Number two. Number two. I like this one. I'm a single virgin man in my mid-20s with a house and a good job. And I like being single for the most part. I broke my porn lust many years ago and remain celibate. I do desire marriage, but I honestly have bitter feelings about relationships from just seeing other men dealing with the stresses of it all. It's a big turnoff. I have a well-rounded life and enjoy my hobbies like working out and playing music, but I don't think I should go on like this forever because I'm a sexy-looking dude and I know it. (laughs) Is it good or bad for a man like me to be alone? Well... I want to kind of break down the question. Long question. Good question. I like the honesty. Church, we should be honest. I like it. And so first thing, uh, 
Big props to whoever you are for saving yourself for marriage. I, I love that. For kicking your porn addiction. More guys and girls need to get that under control. And for being financially stable and in general, it seems like a good dude. Whoever you are, big props to you. Secondly, though, you might want to tame your tone. Because there's a big difference between being confident in who you are in Christ and what you deserve and a tool bag. <laughs> right? Like there's a difference. You might be single still because you're option number two. <laughs> if I can speak my truth. Right? Because no, no girl wants to be around somebody like that going, I'm a sexy dude. You know what I have? You know what you have? You see me? Like that. It just doesn't remind me of something that's, hey, that's something I'm looking for. I want a dude that knows he's sexy. I'm sexy and I know it, right? And so, uh, but here's the third thing I want to really focus on. Those first two were, were, were like, third thing. Now, I want to focus on the part where he says, I do desire marriage, but I have bitter feelings because I watch everybody else deal with it, and that's a big turnoff. And I want to teach you what the Bible says about finding a wife, right? Here's what the Bible says in Genesis 2. First thing it says, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for a man to be alone. So what did the Bible do? He created a, a, a person, a woman, that was a suitable helpmate. So for most of us, most of us, every, every once in a while, God calls somebody to be single and to go on a mission trip and just, you know, you can read about it in scripture. Paul stays single through his life because he knows he can't have a wife and kids and do what God has called him to do and never be home because it's impossible, you know, to do what he's called to do and be a good father at the same time one of them would suffer so he just said i'm not going to get married but for most of us we're going to get married like mo some of you seem like i'm never gonna you probably at some point are going to find somebody to marry there's some my aunt you say there's somebody for everybody right like that's that's the goodness of god can i get it? amen but here, here here's the second thing you need to understand what does scripture say in proverbs 18 it says he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the lord so here, here's my visual you're going to a group with a bunch of men. Most of the time, it's, it's, a, it's like a Christian small group, right? Which, if you're not careful, a bunch of Christians turn into a bunch of whiners. You ever been around that? You're like, all we're doing is complaining and all this stuff. And you have a bunch of guys sitting around a campfire, and all of them are talking about how hard it is to be a husband and how naggy that their wife is, and she wants to talk to them all the time, and she has expectations, like paying the bills on time, and she won't let me play video games anymore, and all these things. And you have all all these guys are whining about it and the kids and we, we, we differ on how we should raise our kids and she's this and she's opinionated and she's this and you're looking at a single guy and you're telling a single guy all the bad parts about being, being a, a, a husband and what does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says he who finds a wife finds a what? What does it say? Some, some woman, like this is for you, right? Like you're like, hey, you should amen me at this point. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. So here's what I would say if you're here, get better friends. Find guys that know what they have, that know how valuable and, and precious and, and, and unique, <laughs> unique that their wife is, and, and, and how, how significant it is to be able to be the spiritual leader of their home, where, where you, you, you love taking care of your family, and you love making your wife's, your wife's dreams come true, and, and you love talking, like even all the time just talking, 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 and you put that in. In fact, one pastor said this. I love what he said about women. He said, females are incubators. I love this. This is so true. He said, God made them that way, which is why whatever you give a woman, she multiplies it and gives it back to you. I want you to think about this, this truth. Now, watch this. You give a woman sperm, she multiplies it, gives it life, and gives you a baby. You give a woman a house, she multiplies that, and she'll give you home. You bachelors know what I'm talking about. Sitting up on an egg crate somewhere, right? <laughs> You move a female into there, into that same place, she turns that often into a home. You give her groceries, she multiplies that and gives you a meal. You give her a word, she multiplies it, gives you a sentence. You give her frustration, she multiplies that, gives you hell, right? You can always tell what you're giving a woman by what she's giving back to you. If you don't like what you're getting, change what you're giving. Find better friends. Find friends that understand that about their wife. Like, I, if, if she's getting on my nerves, it's probably because I'm getting on her nerves. I had things to work on, right? Because finding a wife, I got to tell you something. Finding a wife, just like Scripture says, the right wife changes everything about your life. 
I, I'm not here where I'm at. Some of you are like, well, you, what, how do you do what, how you do? What you, do? How, what, you know what? How do you get to, to this place? Leah. She's my greatest filter, my discernment, my Holy Spirit on my, in this world. She, she, she's smarter than me. She's wiser than me. She has kept me from saying things on a Sunday morning that would have got me fired. She's the only one after a service that will say to me, don't say that again. That doesn't make sense. Use better examples. You, you did the same thing over and over again, right? You talk too long. You, you stutter too much. You talk too fast. She's the only one that's in my life that will speak that directly to me. She makes me better. If you're around guys that are complaining about their wives, get better friends that understand the significance about that. Can I get an amen, ladies? Amen. They're a gift. Number, number three is this. Number three is this. Well, what is the difference between finding someone attractive and lusting after them? What is the difference between finding someone attractive and lusting? And then they ask, is it appropriate to lust after your significant other prior to marriage? And so I, I just, I want to kind of open up what, what lust is. Because here's the thing. Lust is one of those things we don't talk about in church. It's like it, you, you, you can pretend you don't do it, right? Like it's, it's often in your head. You do it in private. You do it when no one's, there's a bug up here. Do it when no one's watching. I see it. It's flying around my head. Uh, uh, you do it when no one's watching. You, you, you struggle with it. Pretend you don't. You wear sunglasses at the beach and pretend you're not looking. you on your phone at nighttime. No one's paying attention. You erase your history on your phone. You don't, you don't put covenant eyes on your phone. You don't want people telling you what to do. It's one of those things from a very young age. If Satan can get a hold of you, he will. Like from a very young age. First time that our kids are seeing pornography right now, average age is seven. Seven. Like se seven years old. So if you're, if you're not talking about these things with your kids, somebody else is. So I want to talk about it because it's significant. What's the difference between looking at somebody, finding them attractive, and lusting? Well, so he, he, I, I'll break it down like this, just so you understand what the definition of lust is. Lust, if you understand it, is the intense or unrestrained sexual craving. Here's what Jesus says about lust, by the way. He's really clear about it in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it was said... You shall not commit adultery. Like, that's one of those ones we, like, we know. We're not supposed to sleep with somebody who's not our spouse. That, that's bad. Jesus goes one step further, and he says this. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman, you can change it if you're, if you're a girl, and you look at, at a guy lustfully, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What he's trying to say is oftentimes we make that external action bad, but we don't understand. Internally, our mind, what we're thinking about, what we're focusing on, is actually a breeding ground for death in our lives. So what's the difference between lust and, 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 and looking? Well, I think looking is like a drive-by, you know, thing. Like you, you drive by, you're driving, you see a girl, you see a guy, even when you're married. That's, a, that's, a, that's an attractive female. That's an attractive male. That's very normal. Like I, I'll say, well, hey, that's a good-looking dude right there, right? Like how you doing? Where you, do, where you get your hair done? Like that's very normal, right? Lusting is when you set a camper up and you park there. And you begin to imagine in your head that person, what they look like. You begin to take their, 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 their clothes off or maybe imagine what it would be like to be with them. You allow your, your thought life to take you away from purity in your life. Uh, you, you, you look at things you know are pulling you away from, from uh, the sexu sexual path you're supposed to be on. Of, of, uh, uh, you, you begin to set up camp there. and you just, you just, there, There's a difference. Do you see what the, the, the definition said? I love what it said. It said, it said unrestrained sexual craving. And here's why. Because God has given us how to restrain it. What do you do with your sexual craving? Very normal, by the way. I hate this, too. Your kids start getting old enough. They start getting in interested in the op opposite sex. And if you're not careful and you don't communicate early enough with them, that, that desire begins to create shame in their life where, where they go to opportunities that, that they that just puts baggage in their life. And by the time that they get married, they can't even talk about these things that they have because they're so filled with shame. That, that desire, what's inside of you, that desire to be with a woman or a man, very normal. God gave that to us, but he wants us to restrain it. So what is, what is the restraint? What is the protection? Marriage. That, that, that's what the apostle Paul says. Watch what he says in 1 Corinthians 7. Living in a culture very similar to ours. He says, but since there is so much sexual immorality occurring in the church and in the world, he says each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own 
husband. The husband should fulfill the mar- her marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Some, sometimes I think we listen to verses and everything's passing us by and then you catch the attention of a dude in this room. He's like, I can, I'll, I'll write that one down. I'm going to fulfill that. We're going to have to talk. We're going to we're gonna have to lunch and have a conversation, business meeting, right? Like we're going to... The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. I feel like, guys, this one's easy for us to obey, right? We're like, woo, right? You can have all this, right? Like, this is easy for men. But he's telling us, here's the, here's the restraint. In marriage, my body is your body. Your body is my body. Me and you are together. We become, we become one. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so you may devote yourselves to prayer. What's the one reason you shouldn't be doing it? You ain't been praying that much, don't lie. Don't, don't be careful. Here's the restraint. In marriage, pursuing healthy sexuality together, he says, he says, then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Because there's so much of a lack of self-control. Now, let me just, let me just add on to this. Lust, uh, if you struggle with lust, marriage won't fix that. Let me just make sure you understand that. Lust is something, that young guy said, I've, I've overcome my porn addiction. Lust is something you need to handle or it will destroy your marriage. Your, your married partner was not given to you, so you will never lust again, right? Because that's not, that's not the issue. The issue is you constantly are engaged in a thought process that's leading you towards death. And so instead of focusing on other people who are not your wives, thinking about people that, that's not your husband, thinking about what their body's going to look like, you look at your, your spouse, you make them your standard of your beauty, of beauty, you focus on them, you put your effort in them, you value them, you build intimacy with, intimacy with them, which means into me see did you ever notice that you become one with, with, with them and so how do you overcome lust you you run towards a healthy view of sexuality in marriage you focus your thought life number four is this i think this is interesting somebody then asked why are we not allowed to have sex before we get married and is masturbating a sin i told you if your kids are in here you might want to take them out and so uh and i'm going to be as uh vague as i can be with this one as I, as I can and still hit it, because I don't, I don't want to be overly detailed. Uh, but somebody asks, you know, what, what, what about that? Because lust often leads to that. So is that the way out? So I lust, uh, and then I go by myself, and I do this thing that causes me shame and causes me embarrassment and causes me this, and is it a sin? The first part of the question is, we already know it's a sin. I don't even need to answer it. Next question. Why, why does God say not to have sex till you're married? Why, why can't you? God says. Like, it's just, it's over and over and over again. Hebrews 12 is one of my favorite verses. Marriage should be honored by all. Marriage bed kept pure. And then he tells us, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. He's really in to protecting sexuality in marriage. It's really important. So the question is, before you get married, in marriage, you have this, 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 this need, it's grown, right? Oftentimes because of unresolved uh, uh, addiction to lust and thought life, and you, you fed yourself junk food. I don't know if you ever noticed this. Anybody ever crave carbs? Anybody ever crave sugar? You're like, I'm not going to eat sugar. You eat sugar tomorrow, right? I'm never going to eat a donut again. You eat it. I'm never going to eat a donut again. The next day you see a donut, you crush it. Right? You're like, I'm never going to eat carbs. I'm never, because you fed your body. This, this is the answer to lust. There's two, there's two things I, that I've experienced in my own life. First answer is truth and light. You bring it, truth and light. Right? Second answer is starve it. Second thing, starve it. Starve it. Don't even let your body have it. Get off every app you can get. Get rid of shows. Stop watching shows that have nudity in it. Stop calling it art. Don't go on Instagram. Let me tell you something. If you're, if you're a dude and you struggle with lust, you shouldn't be on Instagram, TikTok, or anything else like that. They're all full of trash. You don't need any of them. You starve it in in your life. And the problem is if you don't starve it, oftentimes it leads to this act where you are self-fulfilling and and, and doing things that you would say, man, are bringing shame and embarrassment to my life. And I think this is so interesting. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, he says, uh, don't lust, right? Stay away from lust. It's like committing adultery. Watch what he says in the very next part of the passage, Matthew chapter 5. I think Jesus is either telling a joke here, being humorous, or sending us a subliminal message, right? Because the Bible never talks about this topic straight on. Watch what Jesus says. And if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. Let me, what's the one thing that causes us to lust? What is it? Where does it start? Our eyes. He says, if your right eye is causing you to stumble, 
take it away, right? It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And then watch this, what he says. I love this. Jesus is so good. He says, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, <laughs> cut it off. I mean, it's very interesting. We have many parts of our body. And when Jesus is talking about lust, in the very next passage, what does he say? Your eyes, your hand. The very things we use to do this thing that oftentimes creates so much shame in our life. Let me tell you why I'm not for doing this. Why I think it's hurting your marriage. Why I think it's pushing you away. Sex is about connection and communication. Spirit to spirit communion with the person that you love in marriage. When you masturbate, there is no other person, so an emotional misfire takes place. Instead of bonding to another in warmth and intimacy and love, you'll be haunted by loneliness, isolation, and shame. It messes up your marriage bed. The man who does this robs his wife of himself and vice versa. She wants emotional and physical intimacy, not just to rush to the finish line. We want to be known. We want to be held. We want to commune. We want to be cherished. Masturbation stunts your emotional growth, right? I've seen this in, 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 in life. Opening up with your wife on a deeper level gets harder as time goes on to the point where it feels like you're running from her because of your shame. I think the worst part is the separation from the Lord that you experience when you value a few seconds of pleasure over your relationship with him. So I, I, I actually think it's toxic to your soul, and I get it. Single guys, you're like, yeah, but I got needs, and you know, if I can't do that, I'll die. I, can I just scientifically, can I just tell you something? You won't die if you don't have sex. There's two things you need for life. Do you know what they are? Water or air. Sorry, three things air, water, and food. Right? I know some of you say, I'll give one of those up if I can have sex, right? But you don't need sex to, sex to live. And so, you, he, once again, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do if you're struggling with lust and masturbation? Get yourself pure and then pursue not only God, but then begin, after you pursue God, begin to pursue in a godly manner a girl that you can marry. Marry her. Make her the standard of your beauty. Protect her. Build intimacy with her. That's what, it's, that's what we're called to do. Let me just give you a few more thoughts. Number five is this. Is there such thing as physical intimacy prior to marriage? If so, what does that look like? I like this question. I was a youth pastor for years and years and years. And so anytime you would talk about sex, uh, some teenager would stand up and they would, you know, talk to you before email even. And they would go, hey, how far is too far? You ever ask that question? All right, we're, we're going to be pure, but like, what's the line? Like, how much can I do and still it not be sin? I remember a few years ago, uh, we preached on this and some, some young, a younger lady, but she wasn't even that young. She was a little older. She had this question. She's like, yeah, I want to be pure and all stuff, but I have this boyfriend and, and we like to cuddle naked. Is that okay? I have more, more questions than I did answers. <laughs> if you can cuddle without having sex, like, what? you probably shouldn't be dating. So that's weird, right? <laughs> Naked, like, and I'm like, no, you can't do that. Why are we even talking about that? Next question, right? <laughs> well, we do this. We do this. Like, how, how far, how far is, is too far? Like, what can I do and get, get away with it? And he, here's, for, just for time's sake, here, here's the short answer that I, that, I, that I would give you if you ask this question. How far is too far is, is the wrong way. I think the, the question is, what is going to build up this relationship? What's going to honor God? And what's going to promote growth as we both pursue God's future for our lives? What, what's going what's to build us up together? What, what's gonna, uh, we, we don't ask that enough. What's going to honor God in this situation? And what's going to promote growth? That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6. Once again, talking to a very promiscuous culture, Paul says, I have the right to do anything. I have the right to do anything. That's what they were saying. But he says, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. He goes on in verse number 18. Here's what he says to them. Flee from sexual immorality. All their sins a person commits against themselves are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Don't you know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Who have you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. What promotes growth? What honors God? What builds us up? Uh, for years, I've been talking to people, giving them the same kind of thoughts that I think are really practical steps. Like here's one. If you're dating somebody, you're trying to remain pure sexually, don't be alone together. 
So I'm like, that is so lame. Like, we, how are we going to grow together? How are we going to get to know each other? How are we going to? You will. You, like, you will. Bu- build, build it healthy. Promote, promote healthy. You're like, don't be alone together. Don't go into each other's apartment and ha- ha- hang out. Don't be alone. Spend time around other people. Keep yourself accountable. Here's another thing I always tell people. Tell somebody else what your boundaries are going to be. Here's what we will and will not do. Here's the curfew we set for ourselves. Like, sometimes I think we like to overthink because we're playing the gray. Nothing good happens after 10 p.m. Can I get my preaching right? After you get married, you're going to be in bed at 9.30 anyways. Like, don't, don't be alone together late at night, parking somewhere, listening to love songs, right? Aerosmith, don't want to go. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Nothing good's going to happen. Here's another one. When you're together, keep all four on the floor. Somebody, somebody would put that online. They're like, what does that mean? And I'm like, well, listen, when you sit together on a couch and both of your feet are on the floor and you've got your arm around each other, usually nothing, that's not that comfortable, nothing bad is going to happen. But oftentimes we go from having all four on the floor to spooning on the couch. And can I just tell you something that was taught to me a long time ago that is true? Spooning always leads to forking. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm right, right? We can't talk about it, and, you know, we don't play, play it in the grave, but let's just be, be honest. Keep everything buttoned and zipped, duh, right? And avoid swapping spit. Like, listen, how, how can we honor God? How can we build growth? How can we build intimacy? And he, here's why. Here's what I've noticed. A lot of people who are sexually intimate before they get married struggle after they get married. And the question has always been why? And I think after years of study and, and watching people and talking with people, I think because people Pre-married sex is different than married sex. Is anybody else tracking with me? Pre-married sex is wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. That's all we do. We'll get Chinese food. We'll go home. We'll get, you know, burgers. We'll go home. Watch a movie. We'll go home. Everything. There's no kids oftentimes. There's no, there's no, there's no lots, of, lots of responsibilities. We're just hanging out. It's just fun. We're laughing. We're always in the mood. After you get married, it's work. Am I preaching right? You got to schedule that sucker, right? You got to set things aside. You got to make sure your locks on your doors work. You, 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 you're tired. You're, you're, you're cranky, right? You have this. You can't do this at this point. You got kids putting their fingers up under the doors. Like, you know how it is. And you, it takes work, right? And not only that, but there's an intimacy that needs to be built that takes work that leads to the actual act of sex. That oftentimes when you spend your entire pre-marriage just focus on physical, and then you get here and you need physical and emotional, and you're like, I don't know what to do. You're like, you got it. You have to talk nice to her, and you got you to text her during the day, and I don't know why she's so distant from me. Well, you haven't said two words to her all day, and you come in at 9 o'clock at night, and you try to smack her on the back, and you're like, I don't know why she's not receptive to my advances. It's because she's a crock pot, not a microwave. <laughs> and if you wanted to get to that point where you're eating pot roast, if you're tracking with me at 9 o'clock at night, you got to turn it on at 6 o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> what can you do to be a blessing? Am I, am I talking right? But if you do it before marriage, you're like, I don't know why. We're just struggling, right? We just slept together all the... It's, di- it's different. So the question is, what's going to build us up? What's going to honor God? What's going to promote growth and unity in our, in our marriage? Let me just give you a few more uh, questions that are, uh, that, that are good. Lord, you can come play me out. Uh, should Christians who abstain from sex... I like this one. This is, this is, this is a good one. Should they abstain from sex, avoid dating Christians who have already lost their virginity? I I absolutely love this question. I I think it's a good one. Okay, I'll give you a scenario. I've I've been in church my whole life. And uh, I was taught from a very young age, don't have sex till you're married. My parents conveyed that. I'm talking personally about me. My parents conveyed that. T- to me, from a young age, don't have sex till you're married, don't look at pornography to destroy your life, do it the right way. They were very good at making sure I knew that they, were, they had a good sex life. They never showed me. That would be weird, right? It's not Arkansas, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> but, but they, they let me know. Like, you, you know what I'm talking about when your parents, like, you'd be like, oh, we're going to bed. Oh, you're like, it's, it's 7.45, Dad. About an hour later, he'd come down in his robe, get ice cream like he was. <laughs> I mean, you can ask him someday. True story. Did it. I have a whole group of friends over there. He come walking down, right? Like a notorious guy. Like he just go back and goes, all right, good night, fellas. 
You know what I'm talking about? Like, I, I'm so thankful that they, that, that was like that. Because I hated the message. Oh, you, should, you shouldn't have sex till you're married. You shouldn't have sex till you're married. Meanwhile, Christians aren't having sex and they're married. You're like, this is, this is lame. I better get this out of the way. And then I'll live my 50 years of wedded bliss, right? And so, so they were really good at that. And so I, I just, I didn't have sex till I was married. Like, I just, I just didn't. Now, I'm not going to say I never messed up and I never pushed the ba- boundary. How far is too far and played it great. But the physical act of sex, I, ne- I, ne- I never did. And I remember uh, when, you, so when you start dating somebody or looking around, it's, it's easy to be like, well, I waited. It's not fair if you didn't wait. It's a good question. I waited. I've been waiting. It's not fair if you didn't wait. But the problem is so many of us come from different walks of life. So what happens if you waited and you met somebody and they came from a different background? They came from a background where their, their dad was gone. So the girl never knew her value of, 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 of who she was because the father was never there to build her up. And so she constantly looked to, to men to, to build her up and thought she was only valued based on her body and how many likes she has. And so, you know, she gave her body away to a bunch of people and, and had sex. But then she gets crazy saved. Like crazy saved. Like she breaks up with the guy. She takes her Instagram feed down. She starts dressing in a way that glorifies God. She doesn't need the validation of a man. You know what I'm talking about? Like crazy saved. Like, like, like don't typically see it. And I met that girl, right? And I was doing my thing and I was trying to be faithful and I met her and she began to share with me. I, I've been here, but I've been radically saved. I started thinking, what, what I go, no, nah, no, nah, it's, not, it's not fair. And I, there's other situations I've, I've seen in church. Like what about the, the, the girl who has kids, right? And then her husband leaves her and she's been left with kids. So obviously she had, she's had sex, right, in, in her life, maybe even prior to her, to her relationship. And then she comes to church and she gets saved and she meets that one guy that's been saving himself for years, right? And she has kids and she's already slept around and they're a little older. Uh, what I tell that guy, I shouldn't date her and marry her because uh, she's already had sex. She's used goods. Or what I say, what a story of redemption. You've been a godly guy, you've got your situation in order, and now not only do you get to be a husband, you get to be a father? You missed 10 months of pregnancy three times? Lucky you! <laughs> Trust me! That's a joke. There's way too many pregnant ladies in this place. We are all cool, right? It's cool. So here, here's my response. I thought about it. I'm like, here's a response. Uh, following Christ in, in this situation is not so much, the question is not so much where you've been. Where, where have they been? The question I was always asked, where are they heading? Where, where, where are they heading? The Bible says not to be unequally yoked. So if you meet somebody and they have a past, but they've been saved and they're serious about their faith and they're heading towards Jesus and you're heading towards Jesus, our, 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 our faith is about second chances and grace and mercy and being restored and, and, and Jesus giving us back what Satan has tried to steal from us. But on the flip side, sometimes we begin as Christians to date somebody, and it's really clear really quick that they go to church, but they're not a Christian. Like, I, I meet girls. Like, I can't find, I, I've had this conversation with a young girl. She was like, I want to find a Christian husband and marry somebody, but I literally can't find any in church that are serious about their faith and don't want to sleep around. And I think to myself, I am so grateful that I don't have daughters in this world because I hate hearing that. If you were a little older, we could work something out. I got a 14-year-old, but you're too old. And so, and here's what I would say to that. Don't settle. You start dating somebody, and they start pushing you in that area, and they start pressuring you, and they start talking about how they just can't control themselves, and they have a lust problem, and you're their only way out, and they can't do this, and they can't do that. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to put your foot backwards like this. I'm going to show you exactly what the Bible says to do. You're going to turn your foot sideways like a soccer kick, and you're going to kick them to the curb. It's simple. Let me, let me show you again. You're going to take your foot, and you're just going, and you're, you're never going to settle because, listen, listen. God has somebody better for you. It's not that they, they can't be changed, but you're not, you're, you're not there to missionary date, right? He doesn't call one of us. We're, we're not missionary daters, right? He doesn't tell you to go out into all the world and date people, right? So you're just going to say, I'm not ready for you. I'm going to set my boundaries high. I'm going to, I'm going to do what God has called me to do, and I'm going to allow him to bring the right person into my life. And let me just end with two more questions that are really serious. Number, number seven is this. What does the Bible say about leaving an abusive marriage? What's interesting is we, we asked for questions on Monday. This is similar questions that I got uh, in 2020 when we did a sermon series called I Hate My Marriage. You guys remember if you were here? I don't know if you were here for that. And uh, we did this series, and then 
we were going to answer questions the last week and COVID happened. So you guys were gone. I had this probably 12 pages of notes, right? And uh, I just didn't think it was fitting to answer questions about dating and sex when we thought the world was ending. So we tabled that, and I uh, pulled it back out this week as we started to go through questions. I just wondered if some of these questions were the same. And this question was asked two or three times. And the question is, I'm in a marriage. Uh, this one's abusive. Some of them were, were abandonment. One of them was abandonment. One of them was, I, this person had an affair on me. What does God expect me to do? Because there's this faulty teaching in church that basically says, uh, once you're married, you're married forever. Once you're married, you're married forever. No matter what that person does, uh, you're stuck with them. Which, if you're single, be really picky with who you marry. But the Bible never says once you, you marry, you're stuck with them forever. Here's what the Bible does encourage us to do. Do everything you can to work on your marriage. Everything. Go to a counselor. Get, get accountability. Put work in. Remember that the greenest grass always gets the most water, right? Sometimes you're looking at it, you're like, the grass is so green over there, right? They're watering it. So stop looking at the green grass in your neighbor's yard. Get the weeds out of your yard and, and water it, right? Like spend time investing in your spouse. But sometimes you get to the point where even though the Bible says God hates divorce, like Malachi, God doesn't want you to get divorced. You get to the point where you're in a, you're in a relationship that's just broken. What does God expect you to do? And uh, I'll give you just a story of, of an experience I've had in my, in my life because I very rarely have ever told somebody to get a divorce. Very rarely, right? Like, God doesn't want that to happen. God's will is that you stay married. But there is times when Scripture calls for it. Uh, and so years ago, we had a guy and a girl in our church. They, they were our friends. And uh, they were so friendly with us that they had been to our house multiple times. And they were actually working uh, kind of not on our staff, but they were helping out at church. Lead, he led worship, like this was the, the situation, and, um, and they were married, and he started having an affair. He got caught, and it, as always, when you get caught, you apologize, right? That's what we do. We don't apologize before we get caught. We apologize after we get caught. They were in my house on a Saturday night, and uh, it all came out. They wanted to talk about it. We were talking about it, and uh, the woman was, she was just a saint. She's like, I want to I stay and work on it, which is, I think, what God's will is initially. I want to fix this. I don't want to break up and mess this. I want to fix this. I, I, I committed to this through the ups and downs. You messed up. Let's fix this. If that would have been the end of the story, we would have been good. Uh, but he kept cheating, kept cheating, kept cheating, kept cheating. And uh, I remember one Sunday she came in and she said, he's doing it again. And I looked at her. I said, what do you want to do? I was like, I'm just telling you, the Bible says you can get a divorce. Like a letter to that because there's so much guilt there. A letter to what the scripture says about being unfaithful in your marriage. And even in that situation, she said, I still, I want to stay with them. I want God to change them. The Bible talks about how the grace from a wife can change the heart and heart of a husband. And I want her to change them. And so I said, listen, listen, I'll believe with you and I'll pray with you and I'll work with you and I'll do all those things. But if you say the word as your pastor, you're ready to go. I'm going to bring a trailer. We're going to move you out. Make sure he's not there or I'll kill him. I remember I got a call just probably six, seven months later. I don't remember what it was. And she said, hey, he's doing it again. And we pulled our trailer out. And uh, we, me and Ian and, uh, uh, and a few other guys pulled up. We got breakfast first. And we were ready to go. And we, we moved her out of that home. And there was not one ounce of me that was like, this isn't God's will. I was like, she's a young girl. She has no kids. She doesn't deserve this. She's a daughter of God. And God has something better for her. And I can tell you right now, God has something better for her. So if you're in an abusive marriage, you're in a marriage where there's, there's, there's neglect, hardened heart, all those things, do everything you can to fix it, but you're not stuck. We're going to go get counseling. We're going to fix this. We're going to go to church together. No, I'm not going to do any of that. The Bible says eventually, eventually the hardness of heart, it frees you from that relationship. Divorce, divorce is, is probably the last option. But I, I want to, some of you, I feel like it's like this guilt, like, oh, can I get divorced? It, there's times where stuff falls apart, and God has something better for you, which I want to remind you, single people, be picky with who you marry, because who you marry makes the difference in your life. Be, be picky with who you marry. Nothing worse than being married to the wrong person. Can I get an amen? That's it? Can I get an amen? Some of you worried, you're like, I'm sitting by him right now. <laughs> and the last question, last question, I, I want to end with this one, because... Anytime you talk about sex, um, there's always a lot of guilt in the room. Just it. Like it, I told you, like, there's always a lot of shame. 
there, there's always a lot of condemnation. And so this, this, this person wrote this, and I love this question. She says, uh, my boyfriend and I had sex before we got married. He's my husband now, but I personally feel that I haven't healed from that sin, which, by the way, is what Satan wants. Satan loves to get you to do something against God's will, and then he wants you to carry it around the rest of your life. He loves that. It's called condemnation. He, she says, I feel so embarrassed, and I felt I failed my parents and my sisters. What's the process to overcome this situation? I love this question. Does God forgive me even though I knew I was sinning? How can I forgive myself? Well, you can't forgive yourself. Only God can forgive you. But I love that question. Can God forgive me even though I knew I was sinning? And here, here's really practical, practically what I would say. How many of you, by show of hands, have kids? You have kids. How many of you, your kids have outright disobeyed you in your life? Not like, not like gray area, like I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. Like outright, like, like outright disobeyed you. Anybody? How many of you have done that a million times? They're like professional <laughs> at it, right? And so even it happened to me this week. My kids were downstairs watching TV on Friday night. You know, we, we went to bed, but I'm always cautious. Like, what are you watching? Nobody's allowed to watch TV by themselves down there. And so they were all down there together. We walked in, they were watching a show that for most people wouldn't be bad, but in our house, we're like, we don't want you to watch that. It has coarse joking in it. They talk a lot about sex. You guys are 14 and 12. You don't need any help with that. Like, we want to keep you pure. Let's not watch this show. We know it's funny, but just because it's funny doesn't mean it's right. So let's not watch this show. Let's find something else to watch. So they put on Napoleon Dynamite, right? And they were watching Napoleon Dynamite, which, which is whatever, and uh, the next day we woke up, we came downstairs, and one of our sons was like, hey, so-and-so, <laughs> they love to get each other in trouble, so-and-so turned on the show we told him not to watch after you went to bed. We were like, and then they all, they, they all start blaming each other, right? Like, they all were down there, all watched it, and I, I got to be honest with you, I was so pissed off. Like, I went into full lecture mode, you don't trust us, you're going to be driving in a couple years, both of you, and if I can't trust you with this show, how am I going to trust you with a vehicle that could kill you, and all these things, and you're never going to go to the mall again, as if that's even a thing kids do anymore, and like, all of these things. And I, I gave him this lecture, and they, we, took, we, took one, we took one of their phones, and we're like, he's like, when can I get it back? We're like, we don't know, which is the ultimate power move by a parent. We don't know, Right? So he asked like three hours later. He's like, hey, when am I going to get that phone back? Like, it's been three hours, man. <laughs> and here, here's what they'll, no matter how many times they do that, we still give them grace and forgive them and love them. And I'm an awful father, earthly father compared to the heavenly father. So I, I just like, I just want you to understand, even though you knew you were sinning, when you come back to Jesus, you repent, you turn your life back to him, immediately he forgives you as far as the east is from the west. He's that good. The Bible says where sin increases in your life, grace increases all the more. In fact, my favorite story in scripture about a comeback from a sexual failure is the story of David. David has it all and he messes up. He has an affair with Bathsheba. She gets pregnant. Their first baby dies. It's a really sad story. And he has this understanding in Psalms chapter 51. He writes this because I think when you mess up, you want to you feel the weight of it and you want to prove to God how sorry that you are. And here's what he says in Psalms 51. In verse 16, he says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. We do this with God. We're like, I'm going to go to church this week. I'm going to give a couple bucks in the offering. I'm going to serve. I got to make things right. What does the Bible say that he realizes? He says, no, my sacrifice, God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you don't despise. I'm, I, I messed up, but I'm not messed up. I failed, but I'm not a failure. There, there's a difference. I have a past, but I'm not defined by my past. I'm a child of God. I'm forgiven. I'm healed. I'm whole. I have a future. Before the foundations of the world, God was molding me in my mother's wombs. He wants to use my life regardless of the mistakes that I've made. My heart is still beating. These are things I say to myself oftentimes because I need it. My heart is still beating. God has a good purpose-filled plan for my life. Are are you tracking with me? The Bible says that there's no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. What's condemnation? It's the voice that's reminding you of your past, right? Jesus is talking about what he has for you in the future some of you struggling when when you messed up you came to God you asked for forgiveness it's gone 
Don't let what you did in the past, the mistakes that you've made in the past, haunt you into the future that God has for you. God has a good marriage in store for you. He has a good sex life in store for you. It's pure. It's a good gift. And don't focus on where you've been. Focus on where Jesus wants to take you. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Great questions if you, were, if you ask, ask these. I can't wait to look forward and move forward into this series. But I just want you to close your eyes just for a second. And I love the promise of Scripture. I love that song. We haven't sang that song for a long time. I thought it was interesting because uh, this sermon series wasn't planned out with our songs. But the promises of Scripture. And my favorite promise is the promise of forgiveness. The promise of grace. Grace on top of grace. The promise of restoration. The promise of healing. The promise of the power to, to break addiction. Those are God's promises. They're all yes and amen. And I'm not naive. I know we come in this room with different walks of life, different mistakes, different sets of baggage. There's guys in this room, you are absolutely crippled by lust. You can't even talk about it. You're afraid. Satan's having his way with you. He loves that you, you're in darkness. He loves that uh, you're in bondage in that area. There's others of us that have been through some stuff in our lives. We were abused when we were younger. We've been through some things where our sexuality has been damaged. And it's hard for us to even function in a relationship, to even have a healthy view of that. Some of us have all sorts of anger built up in our lives, resentment. Some of our marriages, they're, they're, it's just been a mess. Just, just a mess. So many failed expectations. And uh, our situations are different, but the answer to every situation is the grace of Jesus. The grace of Jesus. That Jesus died, that he was put in a tomb, and that he rose again. And through him, through what he did, that you and me experience a new life. We, we experience forgiveness of our sins. We experience mercy and grace. And when we experience that, it's natural for us to let that flow out of our lives to other people. Some of you have been wondering, what can heal my marriage? It's grace on top of grace. It's grace. You want to create intimacy in your marriage. You, want to, you have to have that spirit of grace. You come wounded to each other. So, some of you, you're wondering about how you get over your past. It's grace, the grace of Jesus. He is graceful in your life. It's, it's only ever Jesus. That's why I love church. You can talk about anything and always land back at Jesus. Always. And he promises, speak about promise, he promises to be here. That's why you physically come to church, because the Bible says we're two or more gathered in the name of Jesus, beyond the speaker and the singers. There's nothing significant about us. The presence of the living God shows up. And when he shows up, he can do more in five seconds than all of the other moments combined could accomplish in your life. And he's here. Can you feel him? I'm not trying to manipulate you. I know the piano's playing. That's how you know the end of the service is coming. Helps me wrap, wrap up my message or I could talk for three hours. But beyond even Laurel playing and the emotion of the moment is the reality of the presence of God. And the Bible says that he knocks at the door of people's hearts, that they would just stop running and let them in, have a broken and contrite spirit, that he would take you just as you are, but he won't leave you that way. He wants you. Some of you have never, ever actually heard that phrase. He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to use your life. He wants to heal you. He wants to make you whole. He wants to encourage you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to ultimately change you. And he does so when you yield your life to him and you say, yes, Jesus, I can't do life on my own anymore. I want a relationship with you. So come on, if that's you all over this place, you don't know Christ, but you need to. The spirit of the living God is here, knocking at the door of your hearts. I don't care if you're 12 years old or 75 years old. We all have the same need. It's Jesus Christ. I need Jesus to come into my life right now. I want to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that he's the Lord, that he died on the cross for my sins, that he rose in power, and he defeated both death and hell. He paid my sin in full. I want to leave this place a brand new person in the name of Jesus Christ. If that's you all over this place and you're ready to welcome Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray with you as we close, but I want you to do one thing for me. 
Uh, I'm, I'm all about courage. Lord, we're going to step in, out into courage. Taking, following Christ takes courage. Living in faith, faith takes courage. Lord, it, it, it's something that's significant. So in this moment, if you would say, hey, that's me. I don't know Jesus Christ, but I want to right now. Front to back, side to side, I want you to do something. I want you to stick your hand straight towards heaven and say, hey, you're speaking to me right now. I'm tired of living a life of shame. I see a hand right here. I'm tired of living a life of condemnation. I'm tired of carrying the weight of my past. I want to leave this place in freedom. There's another hand right here. Is there anybody else? I'm going to, live, I'm going to leave this place in freedom. The Bible says the new day's here. The old person's dead and gone. I love that. Paul said that. He had a past. He says the old person's dead and gone. I'm a brand new person in Jesus' in Jesus' name. Let's begin to pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, Lord that we can talk about anything in church. It's a safe place. Lord, it's safe to come into this place broken. But, Lord, you promised to meet us here and change us, to heal us and to make us whole. So, Lord, we're thankful, Father, that, Jesus, you're meeting people right here in this moment, and you are becoming the Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, you're healing what's been broken. You're restoring what's been stolen. Lord, you're filling their life. They can actually physically feel this right now. You are filling their, your life with their, their, your presence, Holy Spirit, right now, power in their life, Lord. Lord, joy and peace and, and strength is coming into them. Lord, you're going to break what's tried to hold them. Uh, Lord, you're going to walk out of this place with them. Lord, they're going to feel your freedom. Them. They're going to feel your love. They're going to feel your joy. They're going to they're experience something life-changing in this moment. And Lord, when they leave this place, they're going to stand on the promise they're a brand new person. What was true of them is no longer true of them. That their sin is forgotten as far as the east is from the west. Lord, you're going to walk into the future with them. Lord, thank you, Lord, that their best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Thank you for all that you're going to do in, the, in, the, in this, this sermon series, Lord, for the questions that are going to be asked, uh, Lord, for the conversations that are going to continue, continue to be had in our homes, Lord, around our, our tables, Lord, in our cars, Lord, just continue to build us into the people that you've called and created us to be. You're a good father, and we're loved by you. That's who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. One more time. Let's shout amen together. Let's clap together one more time. Hey, before you leave, we wanted to say we're grateful you joined us for church. It's our goal to make everything easy to understand, especially for those who don't go to church. We hope you heard something today that had an impact on your life and left you feeling encouraged. If you want to hear more from us, follow us on social media. Search JRNY Church wherever you listen to podcasts and check out more experiences on Facebook and YouTube. We're live every Sunday morning at 945. If you live in Pennsylvania and are local to the Phoenixville or Montgomeryville area, visit our website, journey.church, to plan a visit. We'd love to host you in person. Have a great rest of your week. See you soon.